Good afternoon. My name is Josephine Olson, and I'm the Interim Director of the European Studies Center at the University of Pittsburgh. Welcome to this month's conversation on Europe, which is part of our year of challenges facing Europe. Today's topic is entitled, The Ongoing Struggle to Recover Nazi Looted Art. Today's conversation is sponsored by the Jewish Studies Program and the Center for International Legal Education, as well as by the European Studies Center, which is part of the University Center for International Studies at Pitt. It is co-funded by the Erasmus Plus Program of the European Union. Our other co-sponsors are the Georgia Tech Center for European and Transatlantic Studies, the Miami, Florida Jean Monnet Center of Excellence, the European Union Center at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence at the University of Florida, the Center for European Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. To learn more about our conversations on Europe, as well as other programming, please visit our website, which we will put in the chat later. Here you can also find recordings of past conversations and additional materials. I'd like to thank Ingrid Gomez O'Toole and Kathleen Brett for their help with today's event. You will have the opportunity to ask questions during the panel. Um, feel free to post a question at any time during the discussion. We recommend that you use the Q&A rather than the chat. We will try to get to as many of your questions as we can. This conversation on Europe was organized by Vivian Curran, Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Pittsburgh. Now I would like to turn the program over to Professor Curran, who will introduce the other panelists and moderate the discussion. Vivian? Thank you so much, Joe. And I'd like to uh, join you in thanking all of our sponsors for kindly sponsoring this event. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here uh, to talk to you about this um, subject of Nazi looted art, uh, which I've been working on. And I've asked um, a truly distinguished speaker, Lynn Nicholas, to join me in speaking to you about it. Um, she is the author of an absolutely formidable book, The Rape of Europa, uh, the Fate of Europe's Treasures in the Third Reich and the Second World War. And I've asked her in particular to tell you the story that she recounts in this book. It's a long book, and it bears the hallmark of her two, in my view, superb talents. First, as a scholarly researcher, the research is stupendous. And I say this as a scholar myself who, who reads scholarly works all the time. And the writing is such that this is a page turner. I would like just to mention um, one or two other things about Lynn Nicholas. She is also the author of another book, um, which I would strongly recommend to anyone interested in the Nazi period. It is a difficult book to read, however. So for those who think they um, have the stamina to do this, I, I haven't finished it yet. It's a long book, but it's also just unbelievably well-researched. It's just, you know, I'm someone who has done a lot of reading about this period, and I am learning a lot. Um, it's called Cruel World, the Children of Europe in the Nazi Web, and it is about all sorts of children from all over. Again, for anyone interested in this topic, I cannot recommend it uh, more strongly. She's the author of many, many more writings. Um, she has been a consultant and advisor to museums and, and to other institutions. She's a graduate of Radcliffe College and of Oxford University. And so I don't want to take too much uh, time introducing her. I would prefer to turn over the floor to Lynn Nicholas. Um, and so I will do so right now without further ado. Oh, you seem to be muted. We cannot hear you. Yes, uh, um, I'm, I'm a techie, I am not. May, I may be a good researcher, but techies, technology is, has passed me by. But can you hear me now? Yes. Um, 
Well, thank you so much uh, for that very glowing introduction. My, my second book is a lot. My sister-in-law said, do I have to read all that? Do I have to remember all those names? That was about the first book. And then the second book is she had trouble uh, just reading about the things that I talk about, which are quite nasty sometimes. So um, I will leave it to you to decide. But also thank you very much to uh, the University of Pittsburgh and all of the sponsors who were named previously uh, for inviting me to talk today. So now I'm going to try to um, uh, do some slides along with what I'm going to do is give you a little history of the uh, of the Nazi uh, efforts and um, uh, the Nazi of uh, the Nazi looting, and um, I hope we'll be able to. Um, have some slides to go with it, but I don't see how they're going to work. Um, <clears throat> um, Ingrid, can you help me? <laughs> um, you have to go share your PowerPoint. You're right now in the Zoom video. Oh, okay. You're sharing that. Can you find your PowerPoint? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes, and now what? Oh, there it is. Wait, it's loading. Okay. Or you go on share and open the PowerPoint and then share it again, making sure that you capture the PowerPoint slides. Sorry. Do I do new share or it says you are screen sharing. Oh, there it goes. It's just slow. You got it. Okay. Um, and go to the bottom part where the big screen is okay. in the lower right hand side. Remember the third one? Oh, that's right. There. Thank you. Okay. All right, good. Okay. Um, First one is blank. You have to go to the next one. Right. So, but anyway, the title of this talk, um, which should perhaps be I'm sorry, it looks like she's frozen, but hope, I hope she'll be back in a minute. Yeah. But uh, most of the art that they really loved was uh, really did belong to other people. Oh, excuse me, Lynn, you were frozen. Could you start over again? Oh, OK. Uh, this this talk should perhaps be called Love of Art. Um, is that OK? This, this yes, talk, I, now this we hear talk, you. OK. This talk should maybe be uh, called Love of Art because uh, there were no greater lovers of, of art than Hitler and Goering, who are shown here looking at a picture. And um, But the trouble was that most of the art that they really loved belonged to other people and other nations. So uh, in their desire to possess and um, uh, uh, art and cleanse the nations of Europe of wrong kind of people, uh, almost every work of art would be moved one way or another. And this is just one room of things that were recovered after the war. So you get a little idea of the, uh, of the quantities of art that we're talking about. Um, uh, so they, they moved not only the private collections of that belonged mostly to Jews and, and other undesirables, but they also went after the state collections of uh, France and uh, other countries that they would eventually occupy. And as it became clear to the uh, art community and the rest of Europe that Hitler was headed toward war, uh, somewhat belated preparations began. Um, this was the first war in which the bombing of museums and cities would be a problem. So that things like the, uh, and everyone was aware that the Prado in Madrid had been hit in the Spanish Civil War had been attacked and that the collections had survived only because of their timely evacuation to Switzerland. 
And that was a very famous thing. They actually stopped the Spanish Civil War for a couple of days so that the train loads of art could go to Switzerland. It was really quite a remarkable uh, bit of cooperation. So Polish curia curators ship beautiful tapestries from Krakow uh, down the Vistula, and those eventually went on to Canada, from which it, it took a long time. It took a long time to get them back. Italian statues came down, and the Florentine or the Venetian collections went to storage on barges looking like this, um, which seems a very perilous way to move anything. Um, it might have been better to leave them where they were. And in, pa in France at the Louvre, uh, big, big pictures were taken down out of their frames and the Grand Gallery um, there, that this is a picture of the Grand Gallery. And just as a footnote, uh, in the United States, um, uh, oh, everybody, they, the museums also decided they would send their very best things to um, to storage. Um, and one, one uh, I love, there's a wonderful meeting in Boston that happened where all the museum directors went. And one, one director sort of wondered if, if anybody would notice that the best things were gone. But anyway, there was a little hysteria at first. The Museum of Fine Arts in Boston closed its Japanese galleries, for instance, and posted Minutemen on the roof. Uh, a congressman in Washington suggested that, I mean, they, they were just as ill-informed then as they are now um, in the Congress. And, um, and they suggested that all the buildings in Washington be um, painted in camo in order to disguise them because it is a very glowing and white city. Um, and they also suggested they put anti-aircraft guns on the top of the National Gallery of Art. So it wasn't until they got to uh, Paris in 1944 that the Allies true methodology and magnitude of Nazi looting. Um, the Nazis hadn't done things by half, unlike our efforts, which were very amateurish and the British uh, too, now, the Nazis had been very organized and there were four major well-funded bureaucracies that concerned themselves exclusively with art matters. And they were supported by the full force of Nazi military and police organizations. So I'm talking about things like the Gestapo, the Divisenschutzkommando, which did economics. Uh, it was a very, very, very uh, highly organized I'm sorry, it looks like we've lost her again. And um, spent more than, you know, and, and even the SS got into, um, Well, I think I've, I seem to have lost the, uh, what I can see here. So um, you, you yeah. had frozen and maybe that um, lost your slides. Do you think you could put them up again? Um, I, I think I'll just go ahead and talk. Okay, <laughs> that might be easier. <laughs> Too complicated. Um, uh, so where was I? I said, oh. Hitler had established a personal agency in, um, uh, to build up a vast collection for a huge museum complex that he intended to build in his hometown of Linz in Austria. And Goering, who amassed over 2,000 works, spent far more time on art matters than Hitler did. And even the SS was uh, into art, or more precisely, archaeology, a field which they dominated entirely in Germany in the Nazi era. And their, the objective there was to prove that Germanic peoples had been superior to all others from prehistoric times, which, which even um, a lot of the Nazi higher ups thought was ridiculous. But anyway, this was supported and it kept the, the uh, SS busy. They sent 
you know, people to India and all over the place to do research on Aryan tribes and things like that. And on then last but not least, Alfred Rosenberg, the ideological guru of the party, set up an organization called the ERR, which at first limited think tank. But later the ERI was corrupted by, especially by Goering and expanded to all fields of art, especially in France. So by war's end, these groups and their many subsidiaries by confiscation and purchase on the encapsulated European art market, which had a boom unequaled until the 1980s during the war, would have accumulated literally tons of objects of all kinds from church bells to books to coins, uh, just absolutely everything you can think of. But actually the reshuffling of works had begun in Germany itself way before the war started. When Hitler came to power and he began uh, he, and began to create his authoritarian and ideological empire in which what the, proof, what the Fuhrer approved of took precedence. The arts in Germany were to be purged of so-called degenerate works and the artists responsible for them. And Hitler himself had no doubts about what was not acceptable. For instance, anything that was unfinished or abstract uh, works that satirized the Prussian military or were anti-war or that violated Nazi racial and political ideas um, of things like jazz and, and anything that had to do with, with, with Negroes, with Blacks, uh, as well as items created by Jews or communists. Never mind that the artists may have died for Germany in World War I, which was true of many of, of the modern artists. Um, uh, 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 one great example of this is uh, that Ger Goebbels had his dining room decorated with paintings by Nolde, Emil Nolde, who was um, a, actually a Nazi party member, but they were too modern for Hitler. And so when he came to dinner, he, he had one of his famous fits and uh, Goebbels had to, had to take them all down and replace them with suitable uh, works of art, which were kind of like, um, I know no offense meant, but you know, sort of Saturday evening post cover type things that um, showed how heroic German peasants and uh, soldiers had been through the ages. <clears throat> so the pressure on German museums, which were mostly state owned uh, to get rid of degenerate art was, was tremendous. But by 1937, when they hadn't complied to Hitler's satisfaction, he sent committees of Nazi artists and theories right into the galleries who decided as they walked through what had to go and, you know, this was very hard work, not only because the curators who wanted to save things had uh, sent things back to lenders or hidden things in the closets and the bathrooms in order to save them, but because agonizing decisions had to be made on the spot. I mean, the one slide I was going to show was of a Lovis Corinth painting where the sky, it's a sort of a nice landscape with uh, sort of stormy clouds in, in the top part. and um, the, the, the sky was considered degenerate, but because it was so messy looking and the, but the landscape was okay. So that one was allowed to stay. But in the end, over 16,000 works were removed, 16,000. When you think of how many that is, the National Gallery of Art, for instance, now has perhaps three or 4,000 total uh, in it. So it, it's really quite a lot of art. 16,000 works were removed from the, uh, in German museums, and to make sure everybody got the message, a selection was uh, displayed in a series of degenerate art exhibitions put on by the government. And the main one was in Munich, but they did travel all over the country. And these, these exhibitions had rude remarks written on the walls and, and accusatory things saying that the directors had spent too much money on modern art, et cetera, et cetera. 
But while the Nazis found the works unacceptable for the home folks, um, uh, taking them out of the museums, they weren't so pure as to ignore their value. So soon there was a very thriving trade in works banished from Germany, which was especially beneficial to the to other countries, to the, and 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 particularly to the new and growing collections of modern art in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, so and to speed up sales, the Nazi government in 1939, June 1939 put on a full-fledged auction in Switzerland where, for example, Joseph Pulitzer, who was on his honeymoon actually, bought Matisse's Bathers with a Turtle, which is can be seen still in St. Louis today. Uh, most of the leftovers of this operation were uh, eventually burned in a practice exercise by the Berlin Fire Department which was a tremendous loss to the German museums and, and to the world, whole world. So but the degenerate art policy, as, as we shall see, was not only important for Germany. Later on, it would determine the fate of many works that were confiscated in the, in the conquered lands. And it's very interesting to note that from the legal point of view, that German museums after the war uh, all got together and, and uh, said that degenerate works that were deaccessioned from the museums during the war by the state uh, were not loot. So these works of art are not considered loot by the German museums today and, and, uh, and, and do not normally appear in lawsuits, although in my experience they actually have, but you know, the museum said no, that they, they were sold by the state. Of, of, of which we recognized the, the German state at that time, the Nazi regime. Along with the purging of degenerate art in Germany went the purging of what the Nazis considered degenerate or alien races. So the first idea was to force such people, principally Jews, to leave Germany altogether. But before they left, they often would be forced to sell most of their assets, often at government controlled auctions. Outright confiscations, and in other words, when they drove a truck up in front of your house and took everything out, didn't actually start until 1938 in Germany, after the extreme uh, uh, looting in Austria at the time of the Anschluss and the vicious events of Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass in November of that year, and then massive de deportations of people were even a bit later. In 1939, Hitler had invaded Poland and started to impose his ideology there. And the Nazis also considered uh, the Slavs to be an alien race. And their long-term policy for Eastern Europe included the total elimination of Jews and the Slavic peoples and cultures all the way up to the Ural Mountains. This ethnically clean, cleansed Lebensraum was to be the, repopulated by imported ethnic Germans. And um, in my second book, I, I found some absolutely fascinating uh, files at the, at the Library of Congress here in Washington um, about uh, there were things written by, by the Hitler youth who were sent there kind of like a Peace Corps to repopulate this area. And um, these kids were very saw that this was a terrible thing and that it wasn't working. Um, but anyway, it, it's certainly fascinating reading. And it's it's something that's not so well emphasized or well known in, I think, in the West. So in th these areas in the Lebensraum, uh, any Slavic art, Slavic art was to be confiscated or destroyed while Germanic things found in the East which meant items created by German artists or were or Germanic artists were be would were to be taken back to Germany. Uh, and think this this meant things like the Wittstoss altarpiece, which is in Krakow. It's and it was it was commissioned by the King of Poland at the time to especially for that church. But at, since it had been made by a, a German artist. Uh, it was to go back to the fatherland or motherland or whatever you want to call it. Um, of course, anything non-Slavic that was of high quality would also be taken as it was too good for the Slavs to own things like that. 
So that that would be things like um, Leonardo da Vinci's Lady with an Ermine, which was in the Chartarisky collection in Krakow also. Um, and th these policies were carried out all over Poland and e later mo even more forcefully in the Soviet Union, um, where the population were not only Slavs, but communists. So that was a double, a double whammy. Um, and they took things like the Amber Room, and uh, which is, has vanished and never been found. It probably, the Amber Room is made of, the walls are made of, it's like stained glass. They're made of little bits of amber that, um, so when it was moved, <clears throat> it may have fallen apart. And um, then when they were evacuating the, the Russian, I mean, there's this, German occupied parts of Poland and uh, the Balkan uh, countries, it may well have been, um, it may have, it, it's probably this, at the bottom of the Baltic Sea um, because it was probably loaded on one of the ships that were trying to escape from the Red Armies. After Poland, it was the turn of the Western countries to be occupied. And here the policy was quite different. These countries were to be annexed one way or another to the fatherland. And uh, one wonderful idea was that Himmler was going to um, be given what was the ancient kingdom of, you know, or duchy of, of Burgundy. That was going to be his fiefdom. And how they were going to, you know, define that is not quite clear, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thought. Um, anyway, the, the Western national collections would eventually be totally re rearranged to suit Hitler, but only a few things were taken at first um, because they didn't want to inflame it. it the, the German armies were spread quite thin in the occupied countries and they didn't, they were afraid of, of you know, um, uh, insurrections of some kind. Um, but this sort of rearranging of items was not a whole new idea for Europe. Uh, Napoleon had actually done much the same thing after his conquests. And uh, one of the earliest restitution uh, pro processes took place uh, when after his defeat, Lord Wellington, the allied commander made the French give back most of what they'd taken, which was a, with a lot of fussing went on. But the French managed to had managed to hide a lot during that process. And Hitler was determined to retrieve these things, plus other items taken from Germany as far back as the 14th century by illegal sale, according to him. And uh, uh, particularly the things that were taken as part of the very punitive uh, Versailles Treaty. But the sheer magnitude of Nazi looting and, the, and its genocidal aspects would certainly eclipse all previous efforts. The Nazis didn't just target the national collections of the conquered countries, they also bought huge amounts in the occupied lands. But the buying was far from normal as the money used itself was stolen from the treasuries of the conquered countries and from those persecuted by the Nazis. In other words, they made people pay uh, the privilege of being occupied. The Nazis paid uh, collectors very well and many willing sellers rushed in to deal with them offering items which ranged from junk to in Austria, anyway, the uh, uh, top of the line, the, the chairman in Vermeer, um, the artist in his studio. And this happened all over the occupied countries. But there was of course a very dark side to this trade as the buck vies of the occupation tightened, especially for Jews, survival could become the basis for many a sale. So you could trade a painting or a service of some kind uh, for a visa and a life or for the lives of your whole family. And people would, you know, dealers would procure a painting that Hitler particularly wanted or Hitler's curator particularly wanted. And they would then arrange for 25 people to be able to escape to Switzerland or to Portugal and get to the, you know, <clears throat> and get to freedom. And it's these things uh, uh, that 
uh, these items, especially those that were degenerate and couldn't be displayed in Hitler's Germany, and therefore went into the art market, that are now the most common subjects of litigation, especially in the United States. Uh, and, and they are uh, subjects of litigation, especially as having been sold under duress, which is often very hard to prove or simply uh, sometimes not the case. But uh, most of the cases that uh, we work with now uh, involve that sort of thing. Another way in which the Nazis got things in Western Europe was by simply confiscating the private collections of citizens of the occupied lands who didn't fit into their idea of who should live in the pure German Empire. For instance, the Rothschilds, or that was the most famous one in France. So then that would include Jews, Poles, Russians, socialists, Freemasons, etc., and in the same way that they had done at home. Uh, Wanda Landowska, for example, who lived in Paris, was not only Slav, but also Jewish and a Polish national, which is, you know, like three strikes against her. And uh, the legal basis for these confiscations, which violated the rules of warfare, uh, in other words, the sanctity of private property, was that the owners had abandoned their property and fled, thereby forfeiting their citizenship and ownership rights even if 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 they you know was had legally stored these things in a bank vault while they went into exile and this was particularly cynical because those who sent were sent to death camps were considered to have fled uh, and therefore their possessions became available to the nazis in France, thousands of such confiscated works were brought into the Jure de Pomme Museum where special exhibitions were set up so that the Nazi leaders could choose what they wanted. And Hitler, who never came to these shows himself, but was sent fancy albums full of photographs of the Louvre, got first choice and took only the best. But Goering did come many, many times and did very well managing to fill up eight houses with treasures. And here too, degenerate works were separated from the rest and sold or bartered to dealers who fed them into the general art market. I mean, they would trade a dozen or so Matisse's, Picasso's, et cetera, for one bad you know, fake old master painting. I mean, it was really quite a remarkable uh, undertaking. As the tide of war turned, the restraint showed by the Nazis in regard to the state-owned collections in the West did falter rather badly. Uh, Himmler tried to take the Bayer tapestry, for instance, but was sort of thwarted by the fall of Paris. And his colleagues in Belgium did better making off in a small boat on a stormy sea with Michelangelo's beautiful Bruges Madonna. Um, I don't know if you've seen the movie, The Monuments Men, but the way it happened in the movie is not accurate at all. <laughs> Nobody was killed in the cathedral. Uh, stealing it, but they did they did take it away and, and it was eventually taken to Alt Ause, which was the big storage area for Hitler's collections. Much more impressive uh, than the removal of the Bruges Madonna was the, the removal of half the treasures of uh, Florence to a remote castle on the Austrian border. And this was uh, ostensibly for safekeeping which was a favorite Nazi euphemism. Um, everything was going to be safeguarded or safe in safekeeping, and then they would figure out where exactly they would put things later. These masterpieces were moved without almost any protection from Florence on open trucks through the battle zones. And um, anyway, if, if I can get my pictures going, you'll see a photograph of that. Uh, Allied forces crossed into Germany in late 1944, and even after all they had experienced elsewhere, the Monuments Men, as they're now called, found the conditions in Germany truly shocking. Here they moved in a surreal landscape of skeleton cities um, with, with only bare, you know, occasionally walls standing, uh, and there was no functioning government, uh, there were groups of homeless DPs and citizens and freed prisoners wandering around, burning priceless books to keep warm. Um, and and uh, people were able to pick up whatever they wanted in the ruins and unguarded refuges. And so there were basically very few buildings left to protect, unlike 
the situation in the in the occupied countries. Uh, Lynn, uh, yes, we're just um, it's uh, twelve thirty five, so we have maybe not that much time left. Okay. Um, Anyway, they, th these things were all taken to, collect, to collecting points in um, in uh, uh, in the America in the you know, Allied zones of Europe, and um, uh, and then it, they the Allies had to decide what to do to um, uh, take care of everything, and they it was the American policy was uh, did, they did not want responsibility for all the art. And uh, so um, our policy was to send everything back to the country from which it had been removed. And once it was there, special commissions set up in each country had to figure out just who the objects belonged to, uh, which was not always easy um, when it came to confiscated private collections, especially as the owners had often been forced to move elsewhere or been killed so that quite a number of these unclaimed and un unidentified items are still the subjects of claims and uh, disputes. The Soviet Union, which also had uh, art specialists and its trophy brigades had of course also found tons of art and they had a whole different idea about restitution. They didn't believe in private property. So, um, and, and they wanted to punish Germany for what the destruction that Germany had wrought on them. So they simply took everything back to the Soviet Union, back, regardless of who owned it. And in the 1950s, they gave things back to the state museums of Eastern Bloc countries, but anything belonging in the West or private individuals remained hidden in remote monasteries or the secret vaults of the Hermitage and the Pushkin, uh, whose curators under on pain of being sent to Siberia were not allowed until quite recently to reveal where the art was hidden. And now we do know. And the, meanwhile, the, the Russians nationalized everything that is there. Of course, uh, not everything was recovered by the official agencies and the restitution was not, it was not easy uh, ever, and it's still not, uh, nor is it always fair. Um, if your possessions were relatively major works that have been chosen and confiscated by the likes of Hitler and Goering, recovery was fairly straight, straightforward. Uh, these collections were carefully ca cataloged by the Nazis, listing the original owners without shame. And even then making claims was hard work requiring endless paperwork and dealings with the bureaucracies of several countries, which is, is still the case actually. Um, so it's it was uh, for things that had utterly vanished, the German government did give some compensation um, and still does. Uh, and it's an extensive program that, that is, goes on till this day. It was and is far harder now to recover things that were dispersed in the art market and sold many times and thus could be almost anywhere and uh, are subject to much more controversy. So the legacy of Nazi looting lingers on and many, many objects remain to be found. But I think I'd like to say that I think about 85% of what um, was lost or, or uh, displaced is the euphemism people use, um, has been at least accounted for. Um, uh, and it's just, it's simply a miracle that so much did survive the devastation of the most destructive war in history. And this was not by chance. Uh, and we really do owe an enormous debt to the people of every country who risked their lives to safeguard the, this, the human patrimony. Um, so I will end there. Thank you so much uh, for that, um, and Nicholas. This was illuminating and um, and comprehensive. And um, to to the audience, um, you have just heard uh, about the largest theft of art in human history. Uh, that's what this theft amounted to. You got some sense from uh, what you've just heard of the vast, vast scale of this theft. Um, the, the one thing that you perhaps 
didn't hear about. And, and it could have been in those moments where Lynn Nicholas was frozen. She may have mentioned this is how many of these Nazis uh, simply stole what they wanted for themselves. Um, it, it, much of it was supposed to go to the governments, but um, numerous, numerous officials uh, simply uh, took what they wanted for their private uh, possession. So um, I actually want to tell you about um, what I work on, which um, is- Vivian, before we yes? go on, there was one question. Would we have time for that? Um, so Lynn had indicated she would prefer to oh, at the end, okay. at the end of the entire thing, but I have whatever you want. I mean, I'm happy. Um, so either way is fine is fine with me. If there's if there's um, maybe we should wait. Uh, if okay. That's okay. okay, we can because we're going to um, On the other hand, I am going to be talking about. Um, a topic that I'm I'm going to be pitching for non lawyers, um, but. On the other hand, it is about law. So I feel that um, if if uh, people have questions, to please uh, make that known, and uh, uh, Joe Olson will uh, let me know, um, and and I can answer as we go along. Just because, uh, and mostly just if you can address uh, th anything that I'm not clear about because of their uh, the legal background, but. Um, I'm hoping that that won't be the case, that the, that won't be necessary. So what I deal with are um, the cases that arise in the United States concerning this stolen art. And it might be surprising that there should be any in the United States. After all, this theft occurred in Europe. Um, but in the past two, three years, there have been quite a number of cases that have reached the U.S. Supreme Court. And now on remand, that means after the Supreme Court has already made a decision, it sends back for more uh, factual decisions to lower courts. So some of these cases are now making their way through lower courts. And um, in fact, I'm going one week from today to Washington, D.C. to listen to oral arguments um, in the D.C. Uh, Circuit Court of Appeals in a case uh, for which I wrote an amicus brief to the to the court. Um, so I'll be very interested to see what happens to that. So why is it that so many cases and many, many cases are arising in the US? One reason is the difficulty of suing in Europe. Um, there have been all sorts of problems um, for, for uh, people to sue in Europe. And those people who are the plaintiffs, who are those suing, um, whose cases eventually come up in the United States are those who are refugees in the United States from Europe, those who were able to flee and uh, survive the war that way. And today they are almost all their children or grandchildren. One sees in these cases uh, a lawsuit that began and then it is, uh, they die, the child takes it over, the grandchild takes it over, these cases last forever. So, and then the other reason is a case um, known in the United States as the Altman case that was judged by Justice Breyer at the US Supreme Court. And Justice Breyer, uh, rather the Altman case may be known to some of you who saw a movie called The Lady in Gold um, about the Klimt paintings. And um, excuse me. So sorry. Get rid of this. Um, and so uh, this this case uh, was brought by the owner, uh, the heir to Klimt paintings, which were worth worth a fabulous amount, um, and had been. Uh, stolen by the Nazis in Austria, and after the war kept in a warehouse in Austria, and the government of Austria refused to return them. The owner tried to sue in Austria and was told, well, you're going to have to give us, give the court system some $300,000, $400,000 in order to sue, and she didn't have that kind of money. She was a refugee. Um, and she was the niece of the original owner of the paintings. And so um, 
eventually she decided to bring suit in the United States. And the, the, big, um, the big question legally was, can she sue in the United States courts for something which predated the law under which she was suing? And the law under which she was suing is the subject of what I study, and it's called the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act the FSIA. This was a statute passed in 1976. And so Austria said, well, she's suing about acts which occurred in, uh, you know, the late 1930s, the 1940s, um, long before this act was passed. That means it's retroactive law, which is a violation of international law. And so Justice Breyer said, no, that's not the case, because this act is an act of jurisdiction. The statute is a statute of jurisdiction. And jurisdiction means that it uh, concerns which cases the courts of the United States are enabled legally to hear, to try. And so because it is not a substantive statute, but rather a statute of jurisdiction, therefore retroactive law concerns do not apply to this. And so at that point, um, Austria decided, well, maybe we better talk to her because what if she sues in the United States and they find us liable for over $300 million? So they talked to her and her lawyer, um, for those of you who have watched the film, you will see this, you will have seen this, her lawyer agreed to arbitrate in Austria. And the funny thing for me is that I was appointed by the United States government to be on the Austrian commission that compensated victims of Nazi property expropriation. And so I was working in Austria at that time. My dean had facilitated uh, giving me teaching leave to do this. But we, my, my committee did not deal with art. It, it, there were a few things we did not deal with. And so this Klimt arbitration, which I thought was crazy for her lawyer to agree to, I thought, how can you agree to this in Austria? But the lawyer was right. So one floor beneath my office where we were working um, on 20,000 cases of reparation um, for different kinds of property, her arbitration was taking place with mostly Austrian law professors. And they came through and said, absolutely, she is right. And Austria truly had no leg to stand on. And they really didn't. They really didn't. So she won. And as some of you may know, if you have followed um, the facts of the case, she gets the paintings and she sells them to Ronald Lauder, who... Um, who then hangs them in the Neue Gallery in New York, which it seems to me is a perfect outcome. So the public can see these beautiful paintings um, and she sold them for over $300 million. She by then was in her eighties, but I think the outcome was a good outcome. So anyway, that Altman ruling was a landmark decision for the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. And there were a spate of cases that then arose in the United States courts because they did not have to worry about retroactivity. So um, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act is an act which says that in general, foreign governments cannot be sued in the United States. Um, so in general, foreign governments are immune from suits. Therefore, the word immunity in that, the name of the act. And um, um, that means that there are only certain specified exceptions. One of those exceptions, however, is where the foreign government, which is being sued, has expropriated property in violation of international law. And so it's that small subsection 1605A3, which all of the plaintiffs in these Nazi art cases are suing under. Um, okay, so um, it is a technical statute of jurisdiction. The other aspect of this statute though, which is a very important part, in deciding these cases is that it is self-contained. And that means that judges deciding these jurisdictional issues of can they or can they not try a specific case that's brought by such a plaintiff is that 
they are not allowed to go outside the terms contained in the statute. It's a long statute, but everything that um, has to be expressed in the statute, nothing else can be considered. However, there is something else that's relevant, or at least that is not irrelevant. And that is that the US has a foreign policy to promote the return of looted art by the Nazis to the victims of that looting. And the US has been a leader in promoting this around the world. And so we started this with something called the Washington Principles. And then this was picked up in Europe um, by, by uh, the Theresen Declaration. Theresen is the uh, Czech name for Theresenstadt, which is the German word for the uh, terrible ghetto that uh, existed there from which uh, most people were deported to Auschwitz. Um, and so there was, there was a meeting there, even more countries, that means some 45 countries um, met there and they all signed it. Um, and then there was yet a further uh, meeting. But these are all, um, these are all declarations, principles, but not binding international law. So that means they're not treaties which bind the US. Were they treaties, every judge in an FSIA case would in fact follow the treaty um, because the FISA says if they're treaties, we follow that. Um, so that's expressed within the statute. So the problem is this is a strong public policy of the United States, but it is what we call soft law, not hard law. It's not binding on the courts. So the, the courts, in fact, do think of these principles and do think of the foreign policy. And foreign policy is something that the courts uh, take into consideration. So um, I just thought I would mention a few things about these cases. And one of them um, is, is that in this day and age, that means the last three years, 2021, 22, 23, to this day, one hears most unpleasant um, arguments being made by defendants like Germany, like Hungary, Spain. Um, so let me just mention one case to show you uh, what is really an extreme case of this. This was a case in which um, a victim was in Auschwitz and Dr. Mengele, who was a torturer, um, found out that this victim was, this prisoner in Auschwitz, was a painter and he forced her to paint paintings for him. And so she painted paintings and she survived the war. I don't know if it was in part because she was able to paint paintings instead of doing other things and that I don't know. But in any case, she survived the war. And after the war, she wanted to get these paintings. So the, they were hanging in the museum at Auschwitz where they still hang today. And the museum at Auschwitz claims to this day, a, an apparently serious claim, one that it owns these paintings. She has died, her daughters have taken up the case. And two, that if they are not the rightful owners, then the rightful owners of these paintings are the heirs of Dr. Mengele. I mean, can you imagine such an argument? This is not all. Um, secondly, in a case that was uh, heard in the Netherlands, von Saher, uh, the, Never the Netherlands described the coercion that Hermann Goering exercised. So he was the creator of the Gestapo, one of the greatest thieves of Nazi stolen art throughout the war, as a voluntary sales without coercion. So I am quoting here. And here, this was a case in which he coveted the uh, plaintiff's uh, ancestor's art. Um, and in a case that was just decided uh, in 2021 by the US Supreme Court, the Philip case, 
you had a fantastically valuable art collection, the Weidenschatz, which um, where originally this had been brought to a German commission in Germany and Germany successfully argued to a commission in Germany that had been set up under the Washington principles. So the Washington principles is, are the principles uh, that are specifically set up to return art to victims um, that the transaction had been voluntary. And so after that, the, um, the plaintiffs brought suit in the United States. On the other hand, I have mentioned to you that the US courts are not oblivious to foreign policy. And so there is a case um, where um, this was a California district court. This is a, a case which eventually went up to the Supreme Court and then back on remand uh, to, the, to the lower courts. But here you have the first iteration in a district court means a trial court level, federal uh, court, um, where the court felt it had to rule in favor of the defendant, which was a Spanish museum. And uh, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act applies to government or government owned institutions or government, what's called, what are called state instrumentalities. So this was the Spanish Art Foundation. And here the court said um, that although it felt it didn't have jurisdiction in it, had to rule in favor of the defendant. It said, although the defendant foundation has now prevailed in this prolonged and bitterly contested litigation, the court recommends that before the next phase of litigation commences in the Ninth Circuit, the foundation pause, reflect, and consider whether it would be appropriate to work towards a mutually agreeable resolution of this action in light of Spain's acceptance of the Washington Conference principles and the Theresen Declaration, and specifically its commitment to achieve, quote, just and fair solutions for victims of Nazi persecution. So you can see how the FISA courts are not discarding foreign policy. On the other hand, sometimes they feel that within the terms of the statute itself, they, their hands are tied. Now, I have suggested in my writing that there is another reading of the statute, but that there are in fact two different readings of the statute, both of which are arguable. One is the reading that this court gave, which is that that its hands are tied, um, that it could not give jurisdiction to, in this case. Another one, however, is that another subsection of this statute does recognize and refer to explicitly a different handling of cases where there are claims that the plaintiff was uh, a victim of uh, Nazi looting of art. And there it says there's a different treatment. And so in that sense, one can argue at least that this other section, namely subsection A3, should also be read in light of this explicit uh, policy mentioned in the section 1605, which is of relevance to these same cases that our plaintiffs are bringing. Um, but under the canons of um, common law, we are a common law country interpretation, one could argue it's exactly the opposite. And, and both arguments I think uh, can be justified. So um, just move on here. Uh, I just wanted to mention another reason for the recent resurgence of cases. Um, it also owes something to the fact that after the fall of the USSR, um, Russia opened its archives. And so all of a sudden, uh, a lot more information was available about the whereabouts of uh, Nazi looted art. And so more cases could be brought. Um, and then the internet has enormously enhanced art research and communication capabilities through uh, digital databases. And that is only continuing as the internet um, gets uh, more refined and as these digital databases grow. 
Um, and then the third reason is the Altman case, the fact that, um, the fact that we don't have to worry about uh, retroactive law under FSIA. Um, so just to tell you, I'm just going to basically be wrapping up, but that um, in 2021, the Supreme Court uh, ended what um, one could call the genocide exception to the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. And that was, um, that was a trend in the United States, not adopted by all courts, but by some appellate level courts to say that if any Nazi, if any art was looted or if any property had been taken, it didn't have to be art, in the course of genocide, of a, of a genocidal undertaking. So uh, it didn't have to be the Nazis, it could also be the Armenian genocide. Um, immediately, that was enough to know that there was jurisdiction in FSIA cases. So the Supreme Court says no, Nowhere is that to be found in the statute. And I think this was the correct decision by the Supreme Court, because in fact, the FSIA says you have to look to the terms and they have to be express. Um, that's one reason, that's a strong reason. And that was the reason that the Supreme Court gave. The other reason for me why I approve of the end to the genocide exception is that if one looks at the law of genocide, um, the, the decisions um, in the FISA cases that said that any under any property uh, takings in, a, in an, a genocidal undertaking get jurisdiction under the FISA were saying things like no matter how minimal the taking was, um, it constitutes genocide. So some cases involved uh, prisoners on the trains about to be deported. Uh, anything taken from them would constitute genocide. And the courts were saying the taking constitutes genocide. And the problem with that is that genocide itself is getting to be in international law so diluted and so far from its original meaning that the, the meaning itself is getting very weakened. And so I think that it is better um, if one thinks of the man who worked so hard over the course of his life, Raphael Lemkin, uh, for those of you who might know that name, um, to coin the term of genocide. Uh, these cases were getting so far away, and I know that the judges meant only uh, the best in, in doing what they did, but I think that uh, they, were, they were contributing to a trend that was not, um, that was not a good one. Um, and then the very last thing that I wanted to mention is that um, in keeping with the idea that the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, as a matter of general principle, provides immunities to foreign states. There is the idea that um, there, is an there is an exception um, to the idea that um, the taking in, international, in violation of international law is an exception. There's an exception to that where it's what's called a domestic taking. So the idea is that foreign governments are allowed to do anything they want to their own citizens. And so that has been the argument now of defendants. Uh, Germany will say, and this is the other argument we hear in these cases, which is just a little hard to stomach sometimes, they'll say, oh, you can, we cannot be sued because we were taking property away from Germans. So this would have come as a surprise to people who had to flee for their life because Germany didn't see them as Germans, they saw them as Jews or Hungarians who were uh, operating under anti-Semitic statutes. And of course, in Germany, the same thing. And this has been uh, over and over. So this is an issue which now is being disputed in the lower courts. And this is the issue on which I just wrote an amicus brief. So I think um, I am going to 
give up uh, the floor and allow questions. Perhaps we can start with uh, questions first for Lynn Nicholas and then, and then for me. If there was a question uh, from, to Lynn, and I'll, I'll read it. It says, uh, how were the Czech lands treated by the Nazis in terms of art looting? There was a substantial difference between Poland and Bohemia and Nazi eyes. Lynn? I'm, I'm sorry, the Czech lands? The, yeah, and the Czech, Czechoslovak. How did they treat the Czech? Were the Czech lands treated differently than Poland in terms of looting? Uh, well, it depended on who you were in, in every place. Um, if you were a German, uh, German blood or Aryan, then um, <clears throat> can can you hear? Um, yeah, we can hear you. Uh, could you put yeah. your video on? Or? Okay. Um, it says I can't. You That says you stopped it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, oh. I'm sorry. Um, okay. But anyway, the uh, if you were uh, um, <clears throat> if if you were uh, a a Jew or a Slav and living in uh, Czechoslovakia, I I believe you prob you know you, you were in the same category as Jews and Slavs were everywhere, according to the Nazi uh, you know theories. Um, so I I, I would. You know, I, I, each case is really um, has to be considered quite separately, I believe. And so, uh, um, uh, I mean, people were taken to Theresienstadt, which is in the former, you know, in, in, in uh, former Czechoslovakia. I don't know if, if he's talking about Bohemia. That I, I'm, I'm not. <clears throat> I'm not absolutely sure if, if there was there were certainly I'd have, I think few major collections there that I know of. So uh, I I have, I don't know exactly what um, of any case in in Bohemia. So if if you could be more specific, that would help. Um, I don't know. Arena, are you are you um, able to elaborate? Well. Um, Let's go on to another question. Um, this is from Pavel Levitsky, and he says, thank you so much for a very interesting presentation on such an important topic. I have a question for both speakers. While looting by Nazi Germ Germans during World War II was significant and probably unprecedented, I'm wondering how much singular or specific this practice was. We know, for example, of looting of indigenous art by colonial powers, and it is only now that discussions start about restitution of these artifacts to their owners. Also, in Eastern Europe, the totalitarian regimes used war as a pretext and seemingly unclear legal status of looted art objects to not give back properties to their owners. Uh, or heirs. I wonder if you can determine what kind of pattern or system of hiding the practice of looting and a legal, cultural, political system of silencing the discussion about restitution across time and regions. Sorry. That's for either, either or both of you. Yeah. There, I mean, I, if I, if, uh, I have a, a quick comment um, that um, looting in war time has all, I mean, has happened for millennia, but until about the 18th century or the late 18th century, very, you know, there were no collections belonged to the king or to the duke or to somebody like that and to, you know, uh, so, so they did not belong to the people. So this is, you know, uh, and I think it was in the, in the 19th century, probably that on, under Napoleon. Napoleon's theory of looting was that that the French, you know, system of government was the best, and that he had the right to bring back these things for the edification of the French population. And so that was the basis on which he took very many things from all over Europe. But they were very much specified with the advice of dealers and people like that. 
And um, so um, <clears throat> when it came time to giving things back, there was a lot of, you know, the French didn't want, because they felt they were the only uh, civilization worthy of having these things. And that was, uh, and the Germans were operating on the same uh, ideological basis. Uh, in other words, they didn't like degenerate art. They didn't like modern art. They and they, and they like Germanic things. And so the other things they didn't bother much about. Um, so, I mean, uh, but the power to be able to uh, present a collection, a glorious thing, uh, you know, that's in your sort of in your honor um, shows how much power you have, which would what Hit Hitler's museum, proposed museum would have been is, you know, particularly where dictators are concerned, this is a very tempting thing. And so I think it it has mostly to do with that. I mean, I, I don't see any ethos through the ages, but I, I will defer to Vivian if you legally. Yes, there, there is one other thing just to consider, which is that international law changed a lot over time. So if you read the uh, maybe the oldest uh, well, not the oldest, there were the Greeks and Romans too, but um, the, in, in Western Europe, there's a, a the beginning of a, um, sort of uh, international law is often uh, considered to be uh, grotious. And so he writes that um, looted, what is the spoils of war, what is looted um, belongs to the victor legally. Right. And so for a long time, that was considered perfectly fine under, under international law, such as it existed. There wasn't a whole lot of international law. Um, and that changed. So beginning in the 19th century, that changed. Now, what happens today and what you find uh, particularly with Eastern Europe, and you find it with Eastern Europe concerning Nazi looted art today also, is that these countries also pass statutes, domestic statutes, um, and they greatly limit uh, the return of um, right. looted property. So, they consider it rep reparations. Some places consider it reparations for things that the enemy destroyed in their own country. Um, but yeah. even Shakespeare, I in, in my book, um, The Rape of Europa, I one of the chapter headings is called Lenity and Cruelty in Shakespeare. I think it's Henry, one of the Henry, Henry V. He has a, a thing where Henry warns the troops not to loot because it turns the people of the country against you. So, and that's what happened in World War II with our, our forces that the, the British and the Americans weren't taking loot recovery or the destruction of monuments very seriously. Uh, until they started getting really bad propaganda from the Axis countries. And so uh, Eisenhower realized um, uh, that, it, you know, it was getting us bad press all over the world. So they changed a lot of the, and they, they, they made more, they put more monuments men in and they, they, you know, they made the rules much stricter about looting and uh, protecting monuments uh, because it was politically more wiser to do that. But I just had a, 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 a couple of comments that I, I think um, about uh, uh, some, of, some of the cases that, um, I mean, for instance, you know, it, Often these cases are, are decided on something like the FISA jurisdiction issue or something like that, but and and the merits are then not are necessarily taken into the to consideration, and a lot of the evidence becomes. I guess it's you know it's not. I, I, I gather the judges don't even read that thing, but for instance, in the the one about the. Um, <clears throat> The Casira case, the Tis and Casira one, the one about Spain. Yes, that's the one. Mm -hmm. That's the one. Um, uh, apparently, uh, the woman from this, the woman who owned the painting, sold it under duress. There's not much question about that, but she sold it under duress in order to get another painting out because she made a deal with somebody, 
And after the war, she was fully compensated for the, the um, you know, the going value for this painting um, in, 19, in the 1950s. And then uh, the family never said another word until 2000 or so when it became, you know, more... <laughs> When the, a lot of these things, no these idea where it was. A lot of they these, had no these idea things. where it was. No, they didn't know where it was, but they um, they were compensated for it nonetheless. And that's never that you know that is not part of what the judgment is based on. The fact that she and but the Spaniards do think that that's important. So. Um, well, it will depend on on the. Uh, of course, all of this would depend on whether uh, whether this is if there was fair compensation or not. Um, right, it was, it was full, as I understand it, was full market value. Well, so, that would depend on on the facts. Was it or wasn't it? I certainly. It was. Um, it was. <laughs> but but in in any event. Um, in, in the hot sticker, the von Sacher, a hot sticker case, that's a, the Dutch government, for instance, is very, uh, if, if something was sold by a dealer and hot sticker was a very famous dealer in the Netherlands. And even though his firm was bought by Goering and a, a, a friend of Goering's, uh, Alois Meadle, um, they, they are still considered dealers by the, uh, by the government, and so, uh, and the, the the Dutch government is very rigid about that. So that uh, if if it was taken from a private citizen, it's one thing. If it's if it if it's a dealer, it's a completely different one. And their decisions are are very uh, tough uh, when it comes to dealers. They 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 hate they they basically. I'm not sure that they've ever given anything back to a dealer. So the Dutch government just very very recently. Has they have a new restitution commission. So we'll see. They have turned a corner in that commission, which yeah, they needed to. behaved quite ignobly with respect to the in the Van Saar case. It it did raise such an outcry that now there are a number of cases where they have changed direction and are um, I, are much more inclined to uh, return art to the heirs of victims. Of course, one of the issues that we did not discuss is what happens to purchasers in good faith along the way. Um, and and that, that in art is in fact a big problem. And that's why provenance is so important. That's not an issue. Provenance is not, I'm not a, an art specialist by any means. And so I don't dare go into that issue. But the idea of provenance is that that should never happen to anyone. That one should always know uh, what the history of a work of art is. But there are plenty of purchasers who didn't know. Oh, but also provenance uh, is published provenance is not there. There are no rules about pub. You know, there are no nothing that says that you have to say everything, every everybody you belong to or everything that happened or how much was paid. Um, and the, 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 the dealer records are uh, conveniently not available in many cases. And um, so, I mean, it's, it's a very iffy, very iffy evidence. Yeah, I think that 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 this whole the whole art world is trying hard to remedy um, lacks of that lackings of that kind um, defects. Um, I, I I have to disagree with you entirely. I don't think they're trying to do anything of the sort. I think they're <laughs> the opposite. They they are continuing to try to um, you know protect their options. Obfuscate. <laughs> It is, I would I, I probably one of the biggest internet totally unregulated or now a little bit regulated but minimally regulated industries in the world it's it's very international with money of all kinds and offshore accounts and uh, to this day I mean it's a and very secretive and uh, um, it's a difficult a difficult business. Uh, like the the Welfin shots, for instance. Um, yes, in the Philip case. 
Yes, but the, those dealers, they 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 marketed those the wealth and shots, which was sold by I can't remember what what the origin of it was now, but um, this was offered to museums all across the world, and many museums bought pieces from it. And so it was only the leftovers that they couldn't sell anywhere else that seemed to have been that Goering uh, then, um, you know, took for the German museums. So um, that case is interesting because um, it's very the, argument, the argument of Germany is that when it occurred in June of 1935, the Nuremberg laws, which were enacted officially in September of 1935 had not yet been enacted. So just a few months before the Nuremberg laws are enacted. And so therefore these Jews were not coerced because they were not yet stripped of their citizenship. But in fact, long before then, well, you know, they, they were stripped of all rights. And to say that that was not coercive just seems completely outrageous. If one looks at the history of Germany and the rights of Jews at the no. time, June of 35. They were selling these things in the United States and in, in the Netherlands. They had a lot of them in Amsterdam. Well, that took I mean, place in Germany. They weren't even in the country. No, the, the, the only one was not in the country. The transaction at issue took place in Germany. Oh well, that that's possible, but the objects were not there, so they. Uh, we, we do have another question. Yes, uh, another we're almost question. out of time, but um, a question for both of you: Did governments uh, ally to Nazis carry out similar policies regarding degenerate art and de confiscating art from? Jews. So she's asking about Hungarian, Romanian, Croatian governments, for example. I can just jump in here with France. So France had a big uh, rivalry with Germany. France was occupied by Germany and had what many people consider to be a kind of puppet. It had a collaborationist government. And the one area where Pétain, the, the uh, head of the government, disagreed with Hitler is he wanted to keep the property of Jews for France. He didn't want it to go to Germany. And Germany would go into apartments, including the apartment of my family in France, oh, and, wow. um, and empty it of, of the paintings and the this and the that, including uh, a Sisley painting, which incredibly was rediscovered just a few years ago, incredibly. I don't know how they do that, but somehow it was. Uh, and they would send it to Germany, supposedly to Germany. There are long lists, which are now available from the French archives of what was in each apartment, but that France fought. They wanted all of that kept in France. Um, so for, for Eastern Europe, I am not very much up on what happened. Um, well, I think in Hungary, there's certainly been a lot of uh, claims cases from there. So I, yes. I believe the same thing happened in Hungary that happened in Germany. I, I don't know about Romania and Croatia, I have to confess, but um, certainly in Hungary it was definitely the case. The very f famous families, the Herzogs, the Hadbanis, the uh, Yes, but yes. They had a double whammy in that the communists then when they oh, they got things back, some of them, but then um, then the communists nationalized it so they couldn't take them out of the country. They couldn't sell them when they wanted to sell them. So um, that yes. that makes another layer of difficulty for them, for these, these families. Yes. One of the current FISA cases deals with. Um, deals with art from Hungary where the owners did go back and did sue in Hungary and the courts were completely unreceptive in Hungary. You couldn't get anything back. I think that's the Herzogs uh, or- I some... think it is, yes. I think so they were- extremely... By now it's the grandchildren or some of the grand nephews, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's that's the family. Or Hatvani is another big- Hungarian. It may have been the Herzogs and- and actually, in that case, I learned that it was Eichmann who was um, yes, in he was. Hungary, mm -hmm. who personally stole uh, the art that is at issue in that case. He ended up personally taking it. 
Well, um, so the courts say, I learned my facts about these yes. cases, what the courts tell. I've, I've been uh, quite, one, one principle of, uh, is that if a plaintiff can write anything they want in a brief and it's considered to be true, I guess until it's proven not true by the defendant, which it seemed, always seemed to me not to be right. <laughs> but maybe you've got a different take on that. Well, of course, that, that's, these are allegations unless they're proven to be facts. Um, and, and then they become... And then you, in a court case, there, there seems to be kind of a ping pong where you knock various things out. And so eventually... Right. Something By the time it, it reaches an appellate level... The, the things that the press covers... Uh, particularly when these first things are first come to light, I mean, they first become a case, uh, or, you know, the plaintiff typically sends the brief to uh, the newspaper and, and they say, they quote all this stuff, which isn't necessarily true. And that's very, very hard um, on whoever the defendant is. So I have found um, also on the other side, just to, you know, give the other side of the story. As defendants say things that aren't true, too. <laughs> no, it's not yeah, just and, you know, the the Germany in, a, in the case where um, in, in one of the cases that's ongoing right now, translated from the Nuremberg laws to say that the um, Jews became uh, nationals, when really what the German word is, is, is a subject of the country, and that, that changes the law also. And I thought, really, I'm really, that Germany today should be making arguments like that. Well, so I, I, I wrote I, my piece in the amicus brief, but will courts read that? I don't it's know. Very, it's complicated. That's an interesting thing that, that they did have still German passports, but so they were some kind of a citizen or, or national of they the were no longer citizens. But then what do you call them? So is the German Our, word. That means some it that means a, a subject. They were subjects. Subject. So they yeah. were deportable. So they were murderable <laughs> by the that nationals or some yes. Uh, nationals, I think to say nationals also is um, a word that uh, we use. Would not have used that. They would not have used that. <laughs> yeah. They were not part of the German nation, which was the Volk, which they were exactly not part of, according oh, no, to the law at the time. So, yeah, so you, you see that. I mean, that's the problem with the, that, that with an adversarial system. Yeah. I think we're about out of time, but I want to thank you for this marvelous discussion and presentation of Vivian and Lynn. Thank, thank you so you. much. And thank you, Lynn, so much for joining us. Yeah. It's really oh. a privilege to have you here. I'm so, I'm so sorry the slides didn't work because they're very impressive. Um, <laughs> well, Wi Fi is not very good in this neighborhood, it goes in and out all the time. So, I'm, yeah, once, once you stop showing slides, we didn't have any more problems with your voice freezing. So, I think that was it. <laughs> thank so you both good. so much. And, and thank you, Joe, for taking over <laughs> my yeah. role as moderator to a large extent. Oh, I'm um, sorry, I didn't um, mean to do that, but. Oh, please. Uh, thank you for doing that. It's kind of hard to read the Q&A at the same time. So um, anyway, thank you. Um, All right. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.